Good evening, everyone. It's nice to see you here. Um, given all the snow and rain and sleet and hail that's taking place in other parts of the country, it's such a delight to be here where it's 60 degrees and 70 degrees without all of that stuff. Uh, so it's really uh, a pleasure to see you here this evening. Um, this is the launch of one of the most important things that the Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism will do over the next couple of years. And this is a project that we call Economic Literacy and Entrepreneurship. Economic Literacy and Entrepreneurship. And this was a project that started actually before the current economic crisis. Uh, but it came from a realization that economics and economic literacy and the ability to understand and describe that was more and more at the heart of what all of us do as communicators and as journalists. How can you cover a story about the housing crisis? How can you cover a story about health care? How can you cover a story about uh, immigration if you do not have a basic understanding of the laws of demand and supply, of industrial organization, of economic policy and political economy? So we have decided here at the Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism to make a major commitment in the area of ELE. And the launch of that, really, is tonight's uh, presentation, the title of which is Entrepreneurship and the Future of News. I should introduce myself. I'm Ernest Wilson, Dean of the Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism. And it wasn't that long ago when the topic like um, entrepreneurship and the future of news would have been either irrelevant or boring or contradictory in some way. Because we knew what the future of news was going to be 10 years ago, five years ago. There would be big newspapers and broadcasters. And uh, then there was this new thing called the internet that might play some role in the future of news. Uh, and entrepreneurship, I mean, how boring was entrepreneurship? That was something that was covered maybe in the business section of the newspaper. But uh, putting those two things together um, would have seemed perhaps somewhat useless. How things have changed. We're now at a point now where the survival of journalism and the importance of entrepreneurship are absolutely joined at the hip. Um, the expansion of new media, the uptake of digital media, the revitalization of the legacy media are all tied to the ability of smart, innovative, energetic people to find new solutions to do old things and new ways of doing new things. And at the heart of that, we believe, is uh, people who are risk takers and in um, uh, innovators, in other words, entrepreneurs. And I want to say that if, you, if you're a student at the Annenberg School and you graduate from this school, then we believe you have the responsibility and the expectation to help invent the future, to help invent the future. Alan Kay, who is a friend and industry innovator, a musician, I think he plays a mean guitar, um, and, and sage, once said that the best way to predict the future is to do what? The best way to predict the future is to invent the future. And what we are hopeful that students leaving the Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism will take as part of their responsibility is the invention of the future of the media and journalism and communication in the United States and globally. You will have a chance as graduates of the Annenberg School to help shape the convergence, the coming together of journalism and communication uh, and the future. Will your future, for example, be populated by uh, iPads or iPhones or some other technology? Or more, and more importantly, will your future be populated and characterized by democracy? Will your future be characterized by media and communications helping the poor and the underprivileged to find their voice? Or will your future be committed to helping the rich and the already privileged articulate their voice even more clearly? Uh, it's really up to you. It's up to the young people in this room who will be inventing the future. 
And we think an important part of that is economic literacy and entrepreneurship. Here at the Annenberg School, we have expanded our teaching and class offerings with about a dozen courses in ELE, as we call it, across two schools, journalism and communication, including courses on entrepreneurialism in news at the graduate level, and a course for journalism and communication students on the 10 basic concepts of economic literacy. Uh, I volunteered to teach a course in the fall on an introduction to political economy. We are hiring two new professors uh, in the, uh, this spring to teach in ELE. We have hired two postgraduate uh, uh, doctoral students to teach in this area. We're doing applied research. We're doing theoretical research. Uh, we're also uh, looking at several people in public relations who can help us advance this enormously important field of economic literacy and entrepreneurship. We are delighted this evening to launch a series as part of this package, if you will, of economic literacy and entrepreneurship. We have classes in research, and I, I should also add in terms of impact that uh, a number of our faculty have been asked to testify before the Federal Trade Commission on issues of uh, economics and, the, and media. Uh, we have had discussions with the Federal Communications Commission, with Capitol Hill, with the White House. So these are both analytically important issues but also we do want to have, keeping with the Annenberg tradition, uh, an impact on the real world. And therefore, we are delighted to begin this series of ELE. And these, you will find that the remarks this evening and subsequent um, um, uh, presentations will take the form of white papers, which will be up on our website uh, talking about uh, ELE. Uh, so we're starting with Michael Schutzen, who is a brilliant scholar and visionary who will give us his own take on what this future might look like and the role of innovation and entrepreneurialism uh, in this future. I might also add that on February 24th, please mark your calendars, uh, Jan Schaefer will continue this discussion. Jan is one of the world's leading authorities on citizen journalism. And she has something at American University, which used to be at uh, Maryland, called the J-Lab, the J-Lab. And it really sits at the frontier of innovation by encouraging community news sites. And so she will be uh, with us a bit later on. But uh, I would like you, as they used to say in the old days, stay tuned. Stay tuned to this matter of ELE, of economic literacy and entrepreneurship. Uh, we welcome your participation in subsequent meetings. Uh, we hope that you will take classes in this area. And more importantly, for those of you who are students, we hope that when you go out into the real world that you will take with you the skills of ELE so that you can not simply be a uh, participant in the future. And uh, certainly we don't want you to be a victim of the future. We want you to take your ELE skills and go forth and help invent the future. And with that, uh, I'd like to turn it over to uh, David Westfall, our executive in residence and former Washington editor for McClatchy who has himself won a couple of awards, if I'm not mistaken, in the area of uh, economics and reporting. Uh, and so with that, I will uh, ask David to come to the floor. Thank you, Ernie. You know, there, there was a time, and it actually lasted quite a, lo a long while, uh, when the news profession didn't listen much to what the academy was saying about journalism. And I, I know this because I was among those who weren't listening. <laughs> um, we practitioners thought, uh, who needed the academy to help us think in new and different ways about our work? And, and that was because we thought we had this already figured out. Well, it turns out it probably would have been a good thing if we'd done a bit of listening. Um, and people now are starting to listen to the academy. Um, so tonight we have the opportunity to hear from one of the Academy's most interesting thinkers and writers when it comes to, um, to envisioning the future of the news business. Michael Shudson of Columbia University has been a scholar of the highest order in writing about journalism. His six books, uh, his fellowship and, uh, fellowships, including the MacArthur Fellowship, his articles and op-eds have set a very high bar for scholarship, 
as well as keen insight into the news industry. It turns out that Michael Schutzen is also a pretty good street fighter. Uh, we saw that when his treatise on the future of journalism, which he authored last fall with uh, former Washington Post editor Len Downey, drew pretty heavy criticism for its call for limited government funding for the news. Our speaker tonight did not duck a good fight. He went to the chat rooms and the comment sections of websites and TV crossfires to duke it out with his critics in ways that won him praise from those same critics. Tonight, Professor Shetson will expand upon the vision that he and Len Downey set out by peeking around the corner to see what might be in our news futures. I'm most pleased to give you Michael Shetson. Thank you, David. Um, thank you, Ernie. This is a, uh, an auspicious time to be here, and uh, it's, there's so much happening in journalism schools uh, as, as well as in journalism, and to, to see the, the, the new initiatives here at USC is, is really wonderful. We're, we're trying to do some similar things at, at Columbia as well, and I know you're in touch with Dean Lemon there, and um, you know, a thousand flowers are blooming in, in the best journalism schools. Uh, as well as in many corners of journalism. Uh, I, I should um, acknowledge in a, a series that emphasizes um, concerns about entrepreneurialism that um, I'm probably the last one to talk about uh, entrepreneurialism. Uh, I've been in you know, this wonderful bureaucratic organization known as universities for you know, all of my um, career, moving up the ladder. Um, I've always admired entrepreneurs, uh, and I do still even more so uh, uh, these days when the need for it is um, uh, so crucial. But uh, uh, do, do what, I, what I say, not what I do uh, in terms of that. Um, I, I want to um, propose to you uh, this evening a, what I call a, a quasi-utopian vision of journalism's future. Uh, it's utopian uh, because it pictures a better array of public informational resources emerging now than we have ever had. Uh, as I will try to suggest, this is part, in part a product of the internet, um, but it's also in part a product of a surprisingly recent professionalization in journalism a remarkable profitability of news organizations in recent decades, and a cultural presumption of publicness that began to emerge particularly in the 1960s and after. Uh, the utopia I'm picturing is only quasi-utopia uh, because I don't have much faith in utopia or utopians. Uh, utopian visions tend to be totalizing and the virtues of a liberal society that I cherish are anything but. The liberal society hopes for unity, but only within a world that honors diversity. The liberal society hopes for common values and collective action, but only when personal liberty and individual privacy are respected and guaranteed by law. And the liberal society recognizes its own incompleteness, its own revisability, and its own contradictions. That, I think, is a recipe for a good society, uh, which is to say, a messy one. So my vision is less than utopian also, because one of the sorts of diversity or social heterogeneity that I believe useful for a society is a heterogeneity of competence based on specialization and expertise. In, in my world of universities, I like it that the social science faculty has the greatest role in appointing social scientists. And the law faculty has the greatest role in appointing the law faculty. I would not want the sociologists, wonderful as we are, to have a particularly large role in appointments at the medical school, or the medical school to have much say in appointing sociologists. Um, and if you feel otherwise about that, please come see me when you're having chest pains. I have a PhD in sociology. 
I will get to the reasons why I think the emerging information ecology can and will very likely produce a better journalistic world than we have seen before. But a necessary preface to that uh, requires that we assess how good journalism has been to this point. As it turns out, we don't have very many serious studies of journalistic quality over time. So what I have to say about this is speculative, but I will do my best to justify the conclusion that one reason that the emerging journalistic world is likely to be better than what we've had is that what we've had has not set the bar very high. I say this with great admiration for the best achievements of contemporary journalism. You can't read the Pulitzer Prize winning stories without taking off your cap in recognition recognition of remarkable writing, frequently remarkable courage, imagination, and fortitude, and often, I would add, the kind of dogged research that deserves not just a Pulitzer Prize, but a PhD. Even so, most of the 40,000 or so journalists writing for daily newspapers, most of the time are producing work that is routine, and more often than one would like, trivial. On the whole, so far as I can judge, journalism before the late 1960s was generally superficial, often servile, usually unambitious, narrowly focused on government, almost devoid of critical inquiry about business, inattentive to the professions, the universities, the environment, women, minority schools, the family. If there was a golden age of American journalism, it began around 1965 to 70 and lasted for a generation. There are plenty of problems with that journalism, too, but it has been our best. In some publications, it has not ended. It continues right into the economic crisis of 2008 and after, and in complicated ways it endures to this day. I would be very surprised to find studies of the content of the New York Times that would discover its enterprise investigative depth or cosmopolitan attitude to be more impressive on any date before 1968 than it is today. And in 2008 and 2009 and 2010, there have been stories of extraordinary worth, difficult to have researched, shrewd in analysis, stunningly detailed, digging beneath and behind the conventional public pronouncements of the day. Uh, the one that sort of took my breath away most Recently, a couple of weeks ago, uh, it was several reporters in the New York Times, Jason DeParle and, and several colleagues, um, on changes in the use of food stamps across the country on a county by county level with data. I, I was so impressed. I said, I, I thought it was illustrating another point I w wanted to make about how much better data has, has been in government produced data. And so I wrote him just to confirm that. He said, the data was a disaster. You know, we, we had to do this by hand. We had to find people deep in the bowels of this state and county level agencies. Um, it took forever, uh, and so on. Um, but it, it, it was a wondrous piece of work. Anyway, I wish I could assert this story of journalistic progress over the past several decades with unimpeachable authority. I can't. It's not so easy to ass assess change, not with the sorts of major content analysis research that mostly hasn't been done. But here are a few bits of evidence that uh, have influenced my thinking on this. Uh, first, all, basically all scholars of journalism and most journalists who've written about this see the 1960s as a major point of transition in which the American news media became significantly more critical and independent of established authority. Meg Greenfield, who began her career in Washington journalism in 1961, before this transformation, recalls in her memoir, uh, and I quote her, we in the journalism business were much too gullible and much too complacent in the old days. The hushed, reverential behavior, <coughs> quiet, quiet policy is being made here, had gotten out of hand. It encouraged public servants to believe they could get away with anything, and they did. In her view, what she calls the great change 
began in the late 60s. It broke down a mystique that said that the people in charge in Washington knew best. They could make things happen if they wanted to. Almost all of them were acting in good faith, and they were entitled to both privacy and discretion to do what they judged necessary for the nation's well-being. That's the attitude, she says, that changed rather suddenly in the 60s. For my purposes tonight, I will simply let Greenfield's recollections stand in for all the others that document this shift from deference or collusion even to independence and critique. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you another time how uh, in 1945, James Reston for the New York Times and Walter Lippmann in his syndicated column covered and praised a path-breaking speech from Michigan Senator Arthur Vandenberg on the floor of the Senate that, as it happens, Reston and Lippmann had written for him. That's the world that changed. So, second point, some longitudinal studies demonstrate in quantitative terms what Greenfield recalls anecdotally, uh, that journalism grew more critical over time. Steve Clayman and John Heritage up the road at UCLA examined a sample of presidential press conferences from 1952 through 2000 and did a close analysis of the questions that reporters posed at those conferences. Over this half century, questioning grew more critical, more persistent, more aggressive. Surely this is part of a matter of style rather than substance. But style matters, and a style-substance divide is not a hard and fast one. Yes, journalists had to demonstrate to their colleagues that they were tough. That's part of what the, those aggressive questions at the press conference are about. But why did they not have to demonstrate that toughness in 1952 so much as in 2000? The questions, at the very least, show the growth of a norm among journalists in Washington, that their job was to be critical, that they were to be watchdogs of government and not a part of the governing operation itself. If watchdog journalism or accountability journalism, as it's sometimes called, is the center of journalistic merit, there simply seemed to be more of it, at the very least, more of a performance of it in 2000 than in 1952. A third point. There was a good study by Carl Stepp in the American Journalism Review that shows that between 1964 and 1999, in a sample of 10 leading metropolitan daily papers, the news hole doubled inside, doubled between 1964 and 1999. The percentage of total news represented by international, national, and local hard news declined. Sports coverage and business coverage increased uh, significantly. But the absolute quantity, because the whole amount of news had doubled, the absolute quantity of this hard news increased in the same period by 25%. Step also found that there were fewer very, very short stories, six inches or less, and there was a growth in the number of stories 20 inches or more. Uh, granted, there were fewer newspapers in 1999 than in 1964, um, but it is not clear how much of a loss that was. Overlap between two papers would have been quite high, particularly in national and international news. Stepp's own judgment at the conclusion of his study uh, is that newspapers in 1999 were by almost any measure far superior to their 1960s counterparts. Better written, better looking, better organized, more responsible, less sensational, less sexist and racist, and more informative and public spirited than they are often given credit for. The only bad news in Stepp's judgment along with that good news, is that the 1999 papers are less flavorful, less surprising, and less imbued with a distinctive sense of place. To me, this sounds like the cake is a lot better than it was. There's more of it. But there's a frosting missing here and there. The fourth, I think this is the last point uh, about why I think uh, the evidence is strong, uh, that that our best period of journalism is what emerged after the 60s. Um, it's a story about Hobart uh, Rowan, who was the business editor at the Washington Post for many years, who said in an interview near, near the end of his career, 1992, 
that he came into his field in 1966 when at the Washington Post, the paper's advertising salesman routinely delivered to the newsroom press releases from major advertisers, a not too subtle way of making sure the handouts got into the paper. As he said, the financial section of most large newspapers was a dumping ground. The business editor was there to rewrite the handouts and in other ways to keep local advertisers happy, not to make waves. Payola at Christmas time was acceptable practice. In short, business news reporting was a true backwater of the news business, 1966. The growth of business reporting from the 60s to the 90s was not only a quantitative increase in reporting, but the production of at least some good and critical journalism in the 1990s when there had been essentially none in 1965. Business news was not alone in its growth, nor was growth in coverage genera generated so much internally as it was by a changing understanding in the broad culture of what counts and who counted in news coverage. When Meg Greenfield came to Washington as the national correspondent for the reporter in 1961, replacing Douglas Cater, Cater took her to the National Press Club to show her where she could consult the AP uh, wire ticker. Uh, the two of them were informed that women could not be members of the National Press Club, um, could not enter its premises except on special social occasions that included them as guests. Uh, she would have to consult the AP wire somewhere else. Now, I'm eager for more evidence on changes over time in the quality of American reporting and, and solicit you for your best evidence. Uh, if some of that evidence runs against my general hypothesis here, well, so be it. But at this point, pretty much everything I know suggests that American journalism before the late 1960s was less diverse, critical, investigative, and thoughtful than it has become since. All of this was produced by a mutually reinforcing, the change was produced by a mutually reinforcing mix of profit, professionalization, and publicness, or what today we call transparency. That much said, uh, I hope I have provoked you to consider that the virtues we prize in American journalism of investigation, of independence, and of skepticism are relatively recent vintage. If there's a decline in the quality and democratic value of our journalism over the past five or 10 years, it is a decline from a higher state of performance than we have had at any time in US history before the late 60s. It should also be clear that the high quality of journalism I'm describing for the period of, say, 1970 on is unevenly distributed. The legacy media survived and did honor to democracy by virtue of a happy accident, as Clay Shirky has put it, that advertisers have been willing for their own purposes to subsidize quality journalism, that Walmart has been willing to pay for the Baghdad Bureau. Shirky is right about this, but it's a partial view. It's also important to remember how little serious accountability journalism most American newspapers ever did. Or to put it another way, there are today more than 1,400 daily newspapers in this country. How many ever had a Baghdad bureau, or any foreign bureau, or any state house bureau? There's been a lot of mourning in the last few years uh, that the number of full-time state house reporters in our 50 states has declined from over 500 to about 350. But that means that at a time when American newspapers were remarkably pro prosperous, and when newsroom employment was at historic highs, more than two-thirds of daily newspapers in this country did not have a staff member at the state capitol. OK, uh, back to quasi-utopia. Let, let's begin with the uncomfortable fact first. Um, in 2000, there were some 60, something over 60,000 journalists employed in the newsrooms of daily newspapers in this country. Today, it's down to something over 40,000. Exactly, exact figures are hard to obtain, but basically somewhere between a quarter and a third of all newspaper editorial employees are gone. Craigslist and other competitors for classified ads have been devastating to newspapers that counted on the classified ads for 20 to 40% of their advertising revenue. Add to this that newspapers competed against themselves 
by providing their news free of charge online, inviting many people among their traditional readers to stop buying the newspaper. They could get it on their computer. And then uh, add to this a deep and prolonged recession that forced businesses across the board to reduce discretionary expenses, and that included advertising. The result is surely a decline in the quality of American journalism. There are just fewer reporters. There are fewer editors. There are fewer pages. There are fewer stories. There is more incentive to run stories that grab readers and less inclination to invest in stories that win more prizes than readers. So on what conceivable grounds can I make a claim that we are about to see the best journalism we have ever had? Well, I, I'm placing my bets on what uh, I expect Jan Schaefer will talk to you about in the next couple of weeks, mm -hmm. um, uh, various online entrepreneurial startups, um, things that when, when I first met Jan, and she's been working with um, these innovative entrepreneurial, um, very often small uh, uh, operations for, for some years. I have to, I mean, she was, Jan was very impressive, but I said, why, why are you spending all your time with this, these little, you know, uh, teeny weeny operations? You know, it's the New York Times, it's the LA Times, that we, that's what we should be wor worrying about. Um, I, I've, she was right, I was wrong, uh, is what I think now. Um, and I am placing my bets for the future uh, on low profit, and nonprofit, as well as commercial media, on collaborative journalism, most of it, not all of it, online. I'm taking as a model the online startups that already exist, from Talking Points Memo to ProPublica to MinPost to Voice of San Diego, St. Louis Beacon, New Haven Independent, RustWire, many, many more. They are springing up, they're growing, they're providing effective journalism, including original reporting and so providing, I think, effective models for the future. They are able to do so with few employees, modest resources, for six reasons. First, they don't need a printing press, and they don't have to buy delivery trucks. Newspapers spend about 70% of their budget on those items, 16% on their own efforts at advertising and marketing, about 14% of their total costs go into the newsroom. The, uh, the internet levels the playing field and nearly eliminates the established newspaper's competitive advantage. If you need a printing press to make your business work, you need capital. And once you get in, you have a substantial barrier to others coming on up after you. If you need only to put up a website and can do that yourself or hire a consultant for a few thousand dollars, you can be up and running with the savings from your summer job. Second. The productivity of an individual journalist is enormously increased by the internet and the personal computer. A couple months ago, uh, I heard the New York Times media business uh, columnist, David Carr, um, uh, at, at a conference. And he, uh, he was at the podium. He returned to his desk uh, and picked up his laptop, held it up over his head, and said, there are more resources in my hand at this moment than in any newsroom, in any newspaper I have ever worked in. This, of course, included the New York Times. Um, no one denies this, but I think few people have really fessed up to it or acknowledged that even without the recession or the over-leveraged newspapers and the loss of advertising, newspapers would still be letting go hundreds and thousands, I think, of reporters because they don't need them to provide even the same level of reporting quality they offered a decade ago. Online searching is more efficient than newsroom hunt, hunt and peck. More information and databases are available online. More and more and more information proves to be just a few clicks away. Third, most of the online operations have taken on an ethic of sharing rather than an ethic of exclusivity. Sure, they want credit for their work, for their stories, but they need and use other media get, to get the stories out. Voice of San Diego editors 
It's an operation of a, a budget of about a million dollars a year, 12 journalists um, working out of one relatively modest newsroom. Uh, the editors appear regularly on public radio, on commercial television, and uh, other outlets in San Diego to disseminate their work. They don't have a huge number of readers, but huge portions of the San Diego population get to hear about what they're doing nonetheless. Uh, newspapers that once would have done everything in their power to avoid crediting a competitor or even mentioning a competitor now trade news gathering tasks with former rivals, now mention the bloggers they read, accept stories from ProPublica, collaborate with Kaiser Health Fellows, take stories from education reporters at the Heckinger Institute at Columbia Teachers College, work on investigative projects with the Cal California Healthcare Foundation uh, that uh, Michael Parks uh, has direct, been directing here at USC. All of this is a transformation in, in sort of the everyday ethic of how journalism works. Fourth, uh, there's a growing availability of relevant data that make first class journalism more accessible than ever before. You don't have to be the New York Times with a thousand people in the newsroom to go online and find out which foreign lobbyist contacted which congressman on which bill. There's now an available database that provides you that information with a few clicks. If you're interested, you go to www.foreignlobbying.org. Uh, where did that come from? The Sunlight Foundation and ProPublica, uh, the, the joint operation of a nonprofit open government uh, uh, advocacy group and an investigative reporting nonprofit startup. Uh, as you know, there have long been complaints about congressional earmarking, but how does a reporter pursue that complicated topic? It would be very difficult, except that a politically conservative nonprofit, Taxpayers for Common Sense, founded in 1995, established an earmarking database. And that database is the start, starting point for any Washington reporter who does a story on earmarking. This is not to mention that essentially all the public information about campaign contributions in federal elections that we have has existed only since the Campaign Finance Acts of 1971 and 1974. That's really the year zero for any useful news reporting about campaign financing. There just wasn't data before then. Are you trying to cover your local congressman, con congressional delegation's voting record? If so, until quite recently, that was a relatively time-consuming task. U.S. government online records did not make it possible to download a legislator's roll call votes by the name of the legislator. You could go online for each bill and bill by bill by bill find out how your congressman had voted. Uh, but if you wanted to know all your congressman's votes, you couldn't do it easily. Well, now you can. You can go to opencongress.org, govtrack.us, washingtonpost.org. It's all there. It's a few clicks away. The San Diego Union and Copley News Service won the 2006 Pulitzer Prize for national reporting that sent uh, my former congressman, uh, Randy Duke Cunningham, to prison for eight years for the largest bribery scandal in the history of Congress. I didn't vote for him. Um, <laughs> reporting the story took a lot of work and a lot of digging, but the reporting, as one of the reporters, Marcus Stern, explained in Neiman Reports, relied heavily on three sources, at least two of which would not have been available to any reporters in the 1950s or 1960s. That included disclosure forms of lobbyists and campaign finance records uh, that a nonprofit in Washington, the Center for Public Integrity, compiled and enabled the reporters to follow up the relationship between some of the lobbyists and the campaign, campaign contributions that wound up being, being the springboard to the disclosures that put Mr. Cunningham in prison. Great claims have been made for this new transparency, probably overdone, but the new databases and the organizations that demand greater accessibility of government databases and have been prepared that, and, and have been prepared to provide that accessibility themselves if the government will not take its own steps is all part of the presumption of publicness 
um, that began in the 1960s, not really before. We think of transparency as something, you know, uh, Thomas Jefferson must have invented. He didn't. He may have aspired to it, but he didn't. Uh, that's really a product of recent years. Uh, the fifth point about why the voice of San Diego with 12, 12 reporters might be making a difference and, and, and comparable organizations elsewhere. The fifth point is that the new online operations remind us that one great resource for journalism, as for many other things, is the resource of obsessive, endless, gritty, enthusiastic individuals. Um, obsessive and compulsive, yes. Uh, and it's also, these people need a way to pay their bills. That's true. And they don't necessarily have it at the moment. But they're not asking to dine on expense accounts. Uh, what they're asking for is to pursue work that gets their adrenaline going and makes them feel like they're doing something that matters. If they can make money doing this, that's good for them, it's good for society, it's good for democracy. But many worthwhile pursuits endure without a so-called business model. Artists, musicians, dramatists have been doing it for centuries. Um, and so have journalists, those who set up their alternative weeklies in the 60s, those who work for political magazines or vegetarian newsletters, or have pieced together a livelihood as freelance foreign correspondents. They lived on a combination of passion and lowered expectations for comfort. With just about everyone I've talked to at the new startups, whether 20-somethings at one of their first jobs or 50-somethings who've been let go or have taken buyouts, they say, I am having the time of my life. This is why I went into journalism. I, I should say, on, in relation to entrepreneurialism, I was, I was at a, um, a lecture demonstration across the street from Columbia, the Manhattan School of Music, um, and the, the dean there talked after the, uh, the string quartet played its quartet, um, and uh, he said, you know, it, for a long time, we've been telling our students here uh, that uh, it's very important that they become fine musicians, but we don't stop there. We say, um, but you also have to be entrepreneurs. You also have to find a way to make your career work financially for you. Um, and uh, I said, where have I been hearing this? Uh, I never thought about the connections between journalism and string quartets, but um, but I now uh, think there really are connections in, uh, in that there has never been a business model for the string quartet. Um, and it is increasingly true that there may not be business models um, for, for many kinds of serious journalism. Uh, as with culture and the arts, universities have and should have a growing role in supporting journalism. Walter Robinson, a Pulitzer-winning investigative reporter at the Boston Globe, left the Boston Globe a couple years ago and returned to his alma mater, Northeastern University, to teach. Uh, he began an investigative reporting seminar for both graduate and undergraduate students. In two years, those students in his small seminars have produced 12 front-page investigative reports in the Boston Globe. Robinson proudly told me, in all this story so far, we've not had a single correction or substantive complaint. Uh, more journalism schools are going into the business of actually producing journalism for the general media. That's not easy, uh, and, it, and it's not without its complications. Uh, but I think it's, it's a great direction uh, for, for both educational reasons uh, inside the schools and for the sake of of the information for the general public. Still, I come back to the point, Voice of San Diego and its counterparts uh, remain small. I don't know how many counterparts there are, somewhere between 50 and 100, I would say, depending, depending on how you count. Uh, meaning by that, online startups that employ and pay at least some sort of a wage to actual journalists, not citizen journalism as such. 
Um, if you add up all of those, they're one, two percent of the employment of <coughs> even the reduced newspapers of today. Um, so why emphasize these developments that on February 11th, 2010, provide so small a percentage of our total news output? Uh, for all the reasons I've mentioned, Be because they are a business, a non-business model, or barely business model, uh, that can employ uh, our, our best young people, uh, put their energies to work, focus on sort of the core of journalism. Uh, they don't have to provide everything to everyone. If they don't want to report sports, they don't have to report sports. They can focus on uh, uh, being watchdogs on government, being watchdogs on power. They're doing it. They're doing it. In small ways, they need some support. Uh, when Len Downey and I produced our, our report last fall, we recommended, we made various recommendations, changing the tax laws to make it easier for news organizations to convert to nonprofit status or to become low profit, limited liability corporations that would allow them to make small profits and still receive philanthropic contributions. We recommended significant new investment in local news reporting by NPR affiliated radio stations. We urged philanthropists to support news organizations committed to local accountability reporting. We recommended that universities get more involved in producing directly for the general media. We recommended the development of more accessible and comprehensive public information databases. And we recommended, finally, that the federal government institute a fund for the direct support of innovations in local news. Um, our report was, was well received in many quarters, but as I guess was entirely predictable, um, our critics ignored 98% of the report and focused on one of our six proposals, that for a fund, a federal fund uh, for local news. Our critics came from two places. Conservatives who opposed essentially all new federal programs, but have learned to defend some of the old ones. And journalists. Journalists on the left, journalists on the center, journalists on the right. Journalists young, journalists old. Uh, why? Well, I, I should acknowledge first that it, it, this is not an entirely dumb response. Um, Government funding does open the door to government control. It can open the door to government control. But I found it amusing when a senior reporter for Newsweek asked me, don't you know that government funding means government control? What was amusing is that he asked that of me on camera at a show we were taping for public television. He didn't see it at all. He it had become part of, of the woodwork that public television is funded by the general public, by not only, but by taxpayer money. To assert that any government funding for the media is the beginning of the end of press freedom requires that you ignore a great deal of the established facts of the world. You have to ignore that NPR and PBS exist. You have to ignore uh, that they exist without, for, have existed for 40 years and were not yet a slave state. You have to ignore that the federal postal subsidies, the newspapers that began in 1792 were crucial in promoting the news industry in the early 19th century. You have to ignore the role uh, that the federal government played in financing the very first telegraph line uh, in this country. And of course you have to ignore as most of us in this country seem too easily to do, all of the rest of the world. Um, that's fine, according to a recent statement that specifically took issue with our report, a recent statement by Harold <coughs> Furthcott Roth, a former FCC commissioner and one-time chief economist for the House Committee on Commerce. He wrote, I quote, direct government support of journalism is a foreign concept. It, it, this was not intended as a compliment. Um, he went on, the Soviet Union had Pravda and Izvestia, 
news outlets that supposedly competed with one another to add insult to the injury of the absence of a free press. Every repressive regime in the world today controls some part of its national media and censors the rest. But that's not the question. The question is not what repressive regimes do, but what democracies do. And Mr. Firthcutt Roth reached immediately to Pravda, not to the $6 billion government subsidy that fuels the BBC and makes it far and away the largest, most ambitious, best funded news organization in the United Kingdom. He ignores the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. His argument ignores the direct subsidy to new newspapers in Sweden, Denmark, Norway, and France, all of them, last I noticed, still democracies. He ignores the studies that find that those subsidized newspapers in France and Denmark and France and Sweden, uh, where the studies have been done, um, find that the subsidized newspapers are actually more critical of government than the non-subsidized newspapers. Government funding does not mean government control in strong liberal democracies in Europe or in North America. That said, we never proposed government funding as a solution to the crisis in American journalism. We proposed it as part of a package that is a solution or a set of solutions, uh, a, and one in which because money is any source of funding is a source, a potential source of corruption. Um, we, that's why newsrooms and, and the business side were kept separate uh, so religiously for so long. That's why people are suspicious about government funding. And that's why, as the more I talk with people about this, uh, a lot of people who receive philanthropic support from foundations are none too happy with the pressure that they get from these private foundations. None of these are perfect. All of them have problems. Um, and so there's a certain advantage in playing them off against one another and having multiple sources of funding. In the midst of a crisis in which talented and skillful journalists are being let go every hour, uh, 10 or hundreds of amateurs replace them in minutes. I'm not persuaded that that is necessarily a good trade. We lose something important when we lose the old pros. But we should not make the mistake of thinking that we are gaining little as we incorporate amateurs. There is something to be said for a distributed, a distributed uh, uh, journalism, one that invites people, professional and not, to participate. Something to be said for the power of wikis. Something profound in the computer software executives claim that no matter how many smart people he assembles in a room to make a decision, he knows that the person who knows most on the topic is not there. Who is that person? He doesn't know. But he's out there somewhere. Um, and he just hasn't announced himself, or has, it wasn't within the network of friendships and colleagueships that brought people into the room. Um, which brings me to uh, an obituary that I read in the New York Times end of 2008. For a, a blogger, the blogger Tanta, an influential voice on the mortgage collapse. Uh, Tanta was a woman in Ohio, Doris Dungy, who wrote, a financial, wrote for a financial blog called Calculated Risk. Her posts analyzed what went wrong with mortgage financing, and they were followed closely by insiders and were cited with approval by Paul Krugman several times in his column in the Times. Who was she? Uh, well, she'd been in the mortgage business for a long time. She knew a lot about mortgages. Did she have a PhD in economics? No, I don't think she had any degree in economics. Um, no membership in any influential council anywhere. She just knew a hell of a lot about mortgages at a moment when all of us suddenly thought, gee, we didn't know enough about mortgages. Um, it's almost inconceivable that she could have risen to prominence and influence without the internet. And yet in one micro field after another, people have started to blog and the best of them get to be known as the best of them. The cream rises to the top. It is not that there aren't dumb blogs out there. There are plenty of them. It isn't that there aren't offensive blogs. There are plenty of them. And it's not that there aren't blogs in which there's nothing going on but venting. But it is that that same form produces and contributes information 
even reporting to the wider world. In, in fact, it seems to me all but miraculous. Um, what, how can all of this be supported? Um, again, th there's, there's no one, one cure, but I think it's very important that we have to, as a society, start thinking about journalism in a way we haven't before. Again, there are lots and lots of very important, even essential activities for which we have never found a business model. Theater, opera, symphonies, serious fiction. There is no business model for poetry. Higher education, K-12 education and much, much more. There has been no business model. This string quartet has no business model. There is no market solution. There are tax-supported solutions. There are philanthropic solutions. And there are various blends of government support, philanthropy, and bake sales that support activities that are well worth doing. And it seems that journalism is one of those activities <laughs> that is increasingly gravitating into that realm. In the US context, I think even the feared and reviled government has to be considered now as one of the sources, not the only source, for funding journalism if the loss of journalistic power threatens the integrity of government and, and the viability of our democracy. Let, let me conclude here with, with a surprising uh, set of remarks from President Lyndon Johnson in 1967 when he signed the Public Broadcasting Act into law. Not only did he hearken back to the $30,000 that the US government provided for the first telegraph line in the country in 1844, he called for not just a broadcast system, this was setting up the uh, public broadcasting, but he said he wanted that this was the first step in an effort to, quote, to build a great network for knowledge, one that employs every means of sending and storing information that the individual can use. He imagined, he said, a system in which a country doctor could get help from a distant laboratory or hospital, and a scholar in Atlanta could draw instantly on a library in New York. He imagined creating an, electro quote, an electronic knowledge bank, and it would be not just national, it could involve other nations, he said, in, quote, a partnership to share knowledge and to thus enrich all mankind. I, I really need to find out who wrote this speech for him. It's, it's, it's quite remarkable. He even remembered in this speech how skeptical Henry David Thoreau had been about the telegraph and Thoreau's famous remark that it's all very well that we are constructing a telegraph to connect Maine and Texas, but it could well be that Maine and Texas have nothing to communicate to each other. <laughs> and he added, we are eager to tunnel under, this is Thoreau, we are eager to tunnel under the Atlantic, but perhaps the first news that will, be, will leak through the broad, flapping American ear will be that the Princess Adelaide has the whooping cough. Johnson quotes that, and then he says, don't, don't join with Thoreau. Don't follow in his footsteps. Don't be skeptical. Um, I do believe, he said, Johnson, that we have important things to say to one another, and we have the wisdom to match our technical genius. Um, th there are lots of grounds for skepticism. There always are. Um, but. I don't think that's the spirit that fuels entrepreneurial activity. Um, I'd reserve the skepticism. As hard as it is for an academic to say that, I would reserve the skepticism at this particularly striking revolutionary moment in our communication system. I hope President Johnson was right about that wisdom, and I hope we will have the confidence to find out. Thank you.
My goodness, Michael, have you gotten this series off to a good start. Uh, what a powerful message and, and a tremendous uh, breadth and scope of uh, discourse about where we are, where we've been, and where we may be headed. Um, I, I want to take you back to the um, report you did with Len Downey, and I, before I start that, please, there are microphones here. We're, we're about to start the question uh, session here, and, and so please, please go up to the microphones and get your questions ready. I'll start here with one. I, I was interested um, in, in the report that you presented, uh, what was it, 80, 90 page report, something like that. Uh, it was done in the standard format, uh, you know, you, a, a Word doc, maybe a P PDF file, mm -hmm. but it's sort of traditional, traditional uh, presentation of a report. And then it went uh, digital, and it went viral, and, uh, and so, as you talked about, did the criticism, uh, and uh, started showing up on, on blo blogs and uh, chat, chat rooms and so on and so forth. And I, I, I mentioned to Michael today, I, I, was, I was surprised, almost shocked, I suppose, to see the, the academic Michael Shudson showing up in one of these comment um, sections of a blogger that I know, Steve Buttry, in, um, and I mentioned this Street Fighter uh, mode there. I, I like that image. <laughs> in, in, uh, in, in strong back and forth conversation uh, and digitally uh, with this blogger who was very critical of, and I, uh, I'm curious what that, what, what that was like. Was that, would it, that, uh, was that a natural thing for you to do? Is this, is this for, a, for an academic kind of to step into this uh, 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 new media form of interact, interactivity on a, on a report that you've just done? Well, uh, it, it was fun. Uh, was it natural? Uh, well, you, I mean, you just heard me give a lecture. Did, uh, you saw the PowerPoint, right? Uh, <laughs> I don't use PowerPoint. I talk um, uh, and I write. I, I'm, I'm not very uh, skillful or um, what fluent with the new media, so I I learned I learned about Steve Buttry from my PhD students, uh, who said, oh, you know, he, there's this interesting blog who's, you know, you know, j just lambasting your report. Um, why, why don't you uh, take a look? And I think I didn't take a look, um, but Steve Buttry sent me an email, said. You might want to look at my blog, and you know, we're happy to have you uh, respond. So I said, "Well, okay." Uh, I respond to email. Um, if you want to send me an email, uh, chances are I will respond and, and quickly. So I, I'm that much into the new media, but uh, or I guess that's old media. But uh, <laughs> but you know, he he was perfectly friendly that way, and I responded. Um, uh, you know, I thought he was he was making a serious argument. I thought it was a wrong argument, I, and um, I, I was happy to engage in him. I guess we went back and forth a couple of times. I did that with some others too. Um, you know, but we, there, the the extent of the response uh, online in the blogs uh, uh, took all of us, Downey and and the dean of the journalism school who commissioned this. And myself, some, somewhat, you know, we, we weren't prepared for it. And again, please uh, step up to the microphones. I know some some of you are uh, re reporting on this for class, and so it's a great opportunity to ask ask questions. Yes, go ahead yeah. and identify yourself. Uh, my name is Amr Saran. I'm a PhD student here at Annenberg. If we could push on for a second uh, what you call the conservative criticism of the of government funding. As I understood it, it wasn't so much a matter of uh, the newsroom becoming beholden to moneyed interests as much as it was insulating the newsroom from market pressure. So if you take away market pressures that might move the newsroom rightward, you're left with the sociology of the newsroom, which tends leftward. And in that context, it seems your NPR example would be more uh, on the side of evidence for that thesis, which is to say, once you insulate the newsroom by providing it government funding, it tends leftward, 
vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the population. I wonder if that came up at all in the comment sections of the blogs or in the larger debate. Uh, it, it did not really come up. I, you know, I think that's a much more sophisticated um, argument. Uh, and we, we certainly did um, uh, some of, couldn't always tell political sense, but I think so, some of the conservatives um, w were uh, hoping that the news media would just disappear. That you know that even the commercial media they thought were far to the left, and we should let just if they were dying, great, just let them die. Uh, we I got um, a couple of letters about NPR not. Um, saying you know, these these people are so far to the left, it's it's ridiculous. But they didn't actually make the argument you're suggesting now. Um, uh, my own sense, I guess, is that you, look, uh, news media can be dependent on the state, um, which uh, is a, is a democratic force of one sort, that is, they're dependent on elected officials uh, responsible to the public. They can be dependent on the marketplace, which is democratic in another respect, uh, that, that they're dependent on people's tastes and what people are willing to, to pay for. Uh, traditional sort of media theory says, well, they shouldn't be dependent on either. They should be independent. That's a problem too, because then they become uh, uh, dependent on one another, and and that's one of the ways. That, you know, if if uh, most journalists, for whatever reason, are of a, a, a liberal persuasion, um, th then you, know, you may not want them. You know, to, if they're to be perfectly fair, objective, professional, you may not want them to be free of the market and the state, uh, perfectly independent. I, you know, I, I don't know what the happy medium is, but it seems to me that uh, th th there is no, there is no uh, perfect model here. And, and it's pr if, if you can invent a media that is partially dependent on its customers, um, they should be paying something, they should be um, uh, I investing time, if not money, in you, partly dependent on um, some kind of uh, relationship to the state, partly dependent on the consciences of the professionals. Some, some blend of that seems the right way. Thank you. Question over here. Hi, uh, Peter Clark. I'm on the faculty here at Annenberg. Um, uh, uh, very taken with your presentation, Michael. And, and uh, apropos of the uh, previous question, I'm wondering what role you see. I haven't had a chance to read uh, the, your report with Len yet, and so perhaps this is in there. What role do you see f uh, for contributions by the individual consumers of information? Uh, who, of course, uh, with daily newspapers, um, what, provided maybe 25% mm -hmm. or some, some sliver. Um, but um, uh, could you expand a little bit about um, uh, your vision for the consumer to contribute to the costs of information he or she is receiving, and um, uh, whether you see that uh, on a piece rate basis or you see some more uh, aggregated form of audience subsidization, at least in part, along with government and along with the marketplace. Um, i.e. advertising, uh, uh, audience subsidization of the costs of the information that they enjoy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, our, our, our report did not answer your question. Um, and in some ways we, um, I guess we sort of ducked the, the question. That is, um, particularly the, the question of, you know, which business model is going to work to save the newspapers or 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 news organizations that produce original content? Um, and we we basically uh, said, what what are we going to 
come up with in six months of looking at this that um, the news executives themselves have not already thought of. Um, probably nothing. Um, you know, neither of us is as close to the data or as close to the market or as close to the audience um, as they are. Um, we look at what, and they're floundering, and they're struggling. I mean, what they've adopted almost across the board is uh, uh, cut your costs, um, you know, cut the newsroom in half. And they were flying high just five years ago with you know, 20, 25% um, profits, maybe they could do with less. Um, and I, I, we were saying earlier today, I think one to two years ago, a lot of people anticipated that, um, that a, a, a deep disaster would have emerged by now, that there would be one, one or two or more major American cities without a daily newspaper. And it hasn't happened. Uh, there, in the, the, there was lots of consternation when the, uh, the paper in Seattle uh, died, but there were two papers in Seattle, and the same when the, the Rocky Mountain News died in Denver, but there's the, there's the Denver Post, and the same in Tucson. Uh, the, the, the largest disasters have all been in two newspaper cities. Um, the, so the, uh, somehow or other, the, this draw in your horns, reduce your, your costs strategy is for the moment uh, getting them through. It, you know, this is not good news for the, the, the people who've lost their jobs, but the, but the newspapers are um, still fulfilling a, a modicum of, um, and sometimes substantial amount of their, of their function. Um, beyond the report, I mean, I, I don't know how to answer the question myself still. I mean, the, um, uh, I actually, I do like the idea of people putting in their pennies or uh, e e even if it's, if it's um, you know, an NPR, um, you know, it was, it was the wrong day for me to drive from San Diego to Los Angeles because both the public radio station in San Diego and KUSC here were having their fundraising day and, and I didn't have any CDs in the rented car. So, um, uh, but you know, that works. Um, it, it isn't, a, I don't know what percentage of their income they get from that, it's modest percentage, I'm sure, but it's, it's one of the things that works and it does, in fact, make people feel slightly that they're, they've, they've helped, they're a part of the community. I, you know, uh, that's, that's one model, there are others, I don't know which is best. We'll take a couple of more questions, so feel free to come up to the microphones. Michael, I'm, and I've heard you talk before about your concern that without um, professionally trained journalists of sufficient number, you might have a situation of, uh, of populism run amok. Mm. Um, we now seem to be in a populist era. Uh, at least there's the, uh, the, there are currents out there, populism. You could easily ascribe that to the economic problems that the country is going to, going through, and some other factors. Uh, but I'm, I'm curious whether you think uh, we are now seeing um, the internet as a contributing factor to a populist uh, movement developing. Um, well, I mean, it, you, you're right. I'm 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 not a big fan of, of populism. Um, I, my my enthusiasm for democracy is enthusiasm for a particular kind of democracy, you know, liberal democracy, rule of law, rights protected, um, you know, um, uh, otherwise you wind up with, with um, uh, the, you know, the, with lynchings, you, you wind up with, um, I mean, the, I, I don't think the people, the, the wisdom of crowds within limits, but, um, you know, lynching is a version of the wisdom of crowds. I don't think that was such a great thing. Um, and uh, so what, um, 
it, it, uh, an, another part, of th these are thoughts rather than an answer, your uh, thoughts in relation to your question. Um, I, I, an, another th thought here has to do with um, uh, what what is it that that um, that the, this sort of internet mediated crowd behavior can provide? Um, and I have to say, my my views and the views of lots of people I know have been changing on that. A um, lot of faculty I know told their students, some still do tell their students, but I don't anymore. You may not use Wikipedia. Um, uh, I did say that three, four years ago. I don't say that. I said, try Wikipedia. Um, and uh, it's pretty good. And uh, uh, in some respects, it's astonishingly good. Um, you know, and that's, um, well, it's, 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 it's now monitored to some extent, but, um, but mostly it works on the wisdom of crowds notion. It's quite remarkable. The, uh, the experiment that, that um, Beth Novick uh, did, she has a very interesting book called Wiki Government uh, with the Patent Office. Uh, saying that, you know, that there are a lot of weird uh, people out there in the world who know a lot about specific technical things. Um, we have trouble in the, patent, in the US Patent Office in finding ways to vet new uh, new patents. You, the, the task is to find that it hasn't been done before, um, uh, that it really is original. Uh, let's just open that up. Um, you know, there are apparently mixed reviews about how well this went, but uh, it went at least well enough to, be a, uh, to appear to be a serious rival to the traditional ways of um, let's, let's go to a peer review handful of professionals and see how, the, so the, all, all of this is um, not changing my views about lynchings uh, or, or the, the sense that uh, you know, Adolf Hitler was elected to office. I mean, the, you, crowds are not always wise, um, but this, this sort of collective sharing of information uh, and a, with a kind of self-correcting self mechanism to it is, is really pretty interesting. I had a very interesting discussion of two journalists in one of my classes this fall um, uh, about how to make, um, what, what the best kind of editorial process was for journalists. And one, one was saying, well, um, the, the traditional editorial top-down process, the editor tells the reporter what, what he got wrong and how to do it right if he wants to see that on page one. Um, that has great virtues. The other one said, well, you know, I, I've been doing a lot of online journalism, and I, I did, write, you know, traditional journalism too. I'm much more fearful, uh, and it makes me think m many more times over uh, about what someone online who reads this is going to say to me, say, you got this fact wrong, than I ever was about my editor saying, you, you, you got this fact wrong. Now, I, I pointed out that there, there's a difference between those two models of social control, that editors comes before you publish, and the online response comes after you publish. But, but she was still making the case that, um, that, this, that, that the capacity the, the internet makes available to us of, uh, of a generalized conversation and, and a kind of wiki-ish set of correctors and editors um, is, yeah, is, is really a better system. I don't know if it's a better system, it's a different system, but, it, but, it, um, but it's a system that has remarkable capacities. Interesting. Larry. Uh, David. Uh, Larry Pryor, I'm on the journalism faculty here. Um, thank you for being here, by the way, I enjoyed it very much. Um, the Federal Communications Commission has just said that it's gonna undertake a study of the future of media and uh, the, their press release said that there was a clear, precise assessment of the current media landscape, complete with an analysis of policy options and as appropriate policy recommendations, not only for the SEC, but also for other government entities and other parties. 
Um, there's, they've sent out an extensive set of 42 questions. Yeah, they sure have. <laughs> and um, uh, one blogger has characterized this as saying, I'm the government and I'm here to help you. <laughs> um, I'm just curious to know, what, what do you think we can expect from this? Is, well, is it appropriate? Oh, yeah, I think it's very appropriate. I mean, the, the, uh, the FCC is, you know, is in the business of regulating telecommunications. Um, and uh, and um, among other things, they have some, um, you know, they, they collect fees in, in license fees and license renewals, and um, uh, they, they uh, a, a tax, a tax on, on your cable services, I think, that, that, that provides the, the E-rate uh, funding for schools and libraries. So they're, they're already in the business of, um, uh, of redistributing and making new media uh, uh, more democratically available than uh, it otherwise would be. I, I think, well, I guess what I, what I hope they come up with is that some of those fees or potentially other fees could be used to um, uh, support a fund for local news, I mean, or for, or some better idea than ours about that, um, uh, to fund a, a additional uh, uh, local reporters at National Public Radio, or a better idea than that. Uh, that you know, in in this climate, the chances of raising taxes. Uh, to um, you know, help out um, a, a, a um, shuttering industry is not going to happen. But um, are are there is there some kind of fee based um, uh, support for journalism out of the FCC that uh, that could help? I think maybe so. Whether they, they are inclined in that direction, I have no idea, and it would still you know be a Struggle in in the Congress, but I, I I love it that they're they're you know doing what will be a, by the time they're done. I, I expect a vastly more comprehensive and extensive study than we did or that the Knight Commission did or others did. I I think I mean I w we'll see what they come up with, but I'm um, I, I'm really pleased that they're they're at least at this point investigating it. They'll come up with a report that will um, uh, make it possible for to teach classes in journalism schools for years to come, probably. So you're not buying the uh, what seems to be the conventional wisdom in terms of reaction to your report that there's no way the government is going to think about um, funding the news in, in significant ways. Well, uh, you know that. There, there's either a glasses half full or glasses half empty version of this. I mean, they, you know, there have been hearings in, in the Congress. There have, has been legislation introduced about the low profit liability corporation model. We don't know how, how that would actually work with news organizations, but maybe it would, maybe it would help. Um, the FTC held hearings. The FCC is writing this report. Um, that, that, that's the glasses half full, the glass is half empty, nothing's happened. I mean, it, it, it's, it's a whole bunch of committees running around. And, and, um, and yeah, I, I would think the smart money is on nothing's going to happen. But, um, but I'm, not con I mean, I'm not convinced that's the way it's going to end up. I, I, I don't know. I, I, you know. Are we going to have the BBC? No. This is not going to happen. Um, but might there be uh, modest uh, increases in federal support in one way or another, even if it's a, a kind of framework support, making it easier for, uh, to change the tax laws, make, make it more easy or at least predictable for a commercial newspaper organization to say, we want to be uh, uh, a 501c3. You can do that, it has been done, uh, but uh, from what people tell me, it's it's very unclear to uh, executives whether they'll, that such a thing would be approved or not. Mm -hmm.
Well, I have to say, uh, Michael, after reading almost nothing but gloom and doom stories about uh, the news industry for the last two to three years, the idea that there might be a better day out there, even if it's a quasi-better day, right. is awfully heartening. So uh, please join me in thanking Michael Schutzen. Thank you.